I'm John Gural. My particular focus at Delphi Research is infrastructure. I spend a good chunk of my time like thinking about how blockchains will scale, how they will interoperate and different kinds of uh, blockchain architectures. Generally as accepted to be the most popular blockchain uh, is Ethereum. However, um, there's like lots of demands to use Ethereum, but not a lot of uh, capacity to make transactions. And this results in like very high transaction fees at times. In the beginning of the year, it was already clear that Ethereum fees were going to be high and, and not suited for mainstream users. And this encouraged like lots of other blockchains. It is possible to categorize these different types of blockchains into like three buckets. The first bucket is what we'd call alternative layer ones or alt layer ones. These are smart contract blockchains, for example, Solana, Avalanche, uh, before it's collapsed, uh, Terra, where, where some of these like general purpose smart contract blockchains, they host all sorts of uh, different applications from DeFi to NFTs to gaming and, and whatnot. In this second category, you have what's called layer twos. Layer twos are blockchains that architecturally sit on top of another blockchain. And so the idea is, for layer twos is that these blockchains effectively will be able to inherit full security from the base layer. So the idea there is that Ethereum is like the most, for example, uh, e economically secure blockchain out there. And so instead of you know launching a new blockchain, uh, anybody can launch on top of Ethereum and uh, inherit its security. And uh, I think this year, Arbitrum and Optimism uh, have made significant advancements in terms of adding uh, these um, shared security tech into their blockchain. The third category is Cosmos App Chains. But unlike the first category of alternative uh, layer ones, in Cosmos, blockchains are more specialized. So they have or control over which applications they run. And this gives them sort of uh, more sovereignty and, and more control over the user experience that they propose. It's clear by now that we live in like this multi-chain world. Biggest hurdles at the moment is that when you're on a particular blockchain, you can use any applications that run on top of it. And like all of those applications compose greatly with each other. However, once you wanna move to another blockchain, um, the user experience is really uh, messy at the moment. Typically, a user would, for example, uh, had to exit the applications that she's using. That means like closing, you know, any financial posi positions that uh, the user may have and, you know, um, transforming all assets across games into like fungible tokens and then bridging those tokens uh, to, to another chain, either through uh, token bridges or through centralized exchanges. Not only the user experience of this is like quite, uh, you know, uh, messy, it's also like quite insecure as we saw like with many bridge hacks that happened uh, over the course of last two years. And recently with the FTX collapse, uh, uh, centralized exchanges have shown there are no better option either. So in order to go to the next step, uh, we need to, uh, you know, really fix this interoperability um, solution which is also like at the core of like uh, how these blockchains will effectively scale. Ethereum was the most interesting one for me, honestly. Ethereum had went through a very like major upgrade uh, this year. It was called the Merge. For those who don't know, Merge refers to Ethereum's transition from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and so it was like literally the single biggest social coordination event in the history of crypto, like just in a matter of two days, the world's electricity consumption just reduced by 0.2% in a matter of two days. And this is, I think, was pivotal because proof of work was necessary in the very beginning uh, where people uh, didn't necessarily recognize the value of tokens, didn't have access to these, like there was no way to distribute these tokens, etc. Uh, but I think it has uh, pretty much served this like purpose. And I think th this was a really good uh, step towards uh, making blockchains more efficient and more economically sustainable. So that was pretty interesting. The most surprising thing for me has been uh, honestly bridge hacks. It was really admittedly painful to watch bridges getting wrecked over and over again. I've admittedly and embarrassingly lost count of them, uh, like Nomad, Binance Smart Chain Bridge, 
Ronin, Wormhole, uh, Poly Network. I think the total loss is around like two billion uh, or something like that at, at the moment. Some of these were like implementation bugs, smart contract bugs, which are sort of not necessarily specific to bridges, but the, some others were, you know, uh, were due to security models of the bridges and keys getting compromised. What we know now is that like these bridges are like huge honeypots uh, uh, that are targeted by uh, nation level uh, actors. So like North Korea hacker groups and stuff like that were behind some of these um, hacks. And so I think moving forward, the key here will be standardizing uh, the code. In some sense, they are losing market share through just like very brutal natural selection. Some developers make, uh, you know, maybe months of work, but then uh, a simple exploit and then now the bridge is gone. And so all of the efforts go to waste. I think people will still like continue to use them. I think there will be less appetite uh, for new developers to be like, hey, you know, oh, let's build a new bridge with our own design. Uh, I don't think that's going to be like the default anymore. I think more of the mindshare will converge on. Is, is there a standard in, for this ecosystem? And if not, can we de develop that so everybody can leverage on top of this? Or if there is one, can we, you know, uh, can we build some applications around that? Uh, so, uh, for example, just like uh, just to make this more tangible, IBC in Cosmos is like definitely the uh, best example out there. Like IBC is the is this standard code that 50 different Cosmos chains rely on. Like all the developers are like their best interest is for IBC to work safely. And so I think that's like a way more healthy way to, uh, to build these. I think the biggest trends for next year are MEV, app chains, and modular blockchains. MEV stands for minor extractable value. Um, it effectively means miners or validators uh, influencing the order of transactions in blockchain with the motivation to extract value out of them. So this could be like arbitrage, like front running, back running, sandwich, uh, etc. The other uh, narrative that's going to be big is app chains. App chain thesis is, is pioneered by Cosmos. The difference of app chains uh, from general purpose chains is that in app chains, the community uh, around the blockchain restricts which uh, applications that this blockchain will be running. So it can pretty much like optimize the blockchain for the particular use case that it's being used for. And finally, modular blockchains. Modular blockchains is about layered uh, blockchain architectures. So basically it's about recognizing the, the fact that um, blockchain's core functionalities can be broken down into smaller pieces and blockchains don't have to uh, own all of those like functionalities, they can actually outsource them to other blockchains. There are like four um, sort of core functionalities. The first one is data. Um, so at the very minimum, blockchain nodes need to share some data. So this is about how we make sure um, that data is there. The, the second functionality is consensus. How do blockchains effectively come to order on that data? How do they order that data? Third one is execution. How do they interpret that data? How do they make sense of it? And you know uh, all the rules around that. And then finally, optionally, settlement is how blockchains interoperate with each other. So in the modular stack, effectively blockchains outsource some of these components to each other. And the idea, the general idea is that they specialize in their, in their uh, own thing. And then collectively they achieve more, basically. That, that results in a more scalable, more interoperable uh, solution. Like by far the thing that excites me the most is modular blockchains. I think it's the most cost effective way uh, for blockchains to launch, to operate and to compose with each other. The, literally the idea there is that one, make it very easy to launch new blockchains. You don't need to go through all this overhead of like, you know, uh, finding nodes to run your blockchain, uh, distribute uh, large sums of tokens in order to build your own consensus. All of these like things that make blockchain engineering lives hard. Like the goal of modular blockchains is to make all of these things uh, easier. In their end state, like what's imagined is that, you know, there's going to be some execution layer. You can compute anything there. 
and then you will basically concise all of that computation into to a very succinct uh, cryptographic proof, which are ZK proofs and fraud proofs. And then anybody can run those uh, proofs, hopefully in their smartphones in the future, and verify the integrity of all of the transactions. So it's effectively the most cost effective way to shift the power structure from big guys to small guys. The, the two projects I'm very excited in the, in the modular stack are Celestia and Fuel. So Celestia tries to become the most scalable data and consensus layer. It tries to be the minimum viable blockchain out there. Basically, it, it asks the question like, what's the least I can do in order for blockchains that sit on top of me to share security with each other? The idea is the idea there is that you know other blockchains can dump their data to Celestia. And then effectively, you know, Celestia would be ordering their data in the same order. And this gives them the least possible ingredients for them to share security with each other. Um, Fuel is modular execution layer. What we mean by modular execution layer is that there's going to be multiple versions of Fuel. Uh, basically, Fuel team has been developing their new um, virtual machine from scratch. Uh, it's called Fuel Virtual Machine. It learns a lot of mistakes that have been done on EVM and other, other virtual machines. Um, so it has some very um, interesting features that make it very scalable and fast. The interesting part about Fuel is that their execution layer will be fraud provable, which means um, like you're going to be able to make a lot of you know, fast uh, computations but then you will be able to prove them in, in a very succinct way through cryptographic proofs. Next year, both of them are going to launch on mainnet and I'm pretty excited uh, for, their, for their launch. Technological perspective, it's easy, I'm super bullish. There's lots of builders out there and a lot of these uh, rails are being built. There is significant advancements in modular blockchains in uh, fraud proofs, in ZK proofs, in technologies like uh, data availability sampling, which would scale uh, the data, you know, published ac across the uh, blockchains. One of the things that I'm looking forward is um, EIP 4844, uh, which is an, you know, Ethereum upgrade. It will uh, reduce um, the fees on rollups by few X. And then also, I think there's lots of developer activity on Cosmos for next year. There is going to be like quite some like high performance chains coming up on Cosmos, which could be interesting. We're going to go up. I think that's my expectation, but it's going to be more, um, you know, slow. No moon action. That's my guess. If you look at the end state, um, like I would be disappointed if like most of what we call money isn't on chain. I, and I think there's like a good chance of that actually uh, happening. The future that I'm imagining is like really thousands and millions of chains. Cosmos Vision is more like community computers. They are they have their own social consensus. They have their own participants, but they're not necessarily you know uh, fit into this like oh there's no governance kind of rule. There can be still a governance, but it's like the, the rules and everything is defined by the, by the participants there. So um, the access to state would can be more restricted uh, and whatnot. But I think. Basically, current regulation, it could shape into these um, sort of blockchains. And so um, this could, you know, bring real world assets on chain. And I genuinely believe in the end state, we're just going to see pretty much all real world assets tokenized in, in one way or another. Call me bullish, but that's, that's what I believe. Mass adoption will happen, happen through uh, a combination of like technologies that are being developed. Like there's no magic secret sauce here. I can summarize these in like four, I think, main categories. It's just like, one is uh, is privacy, it is a big one. So I know a lot of people like uh, around me, my friends, they, they, just, they just don't wanna, they don't want people to know like which coins they buy and sell and whatnot. And they use centralized exchanges as a way to like lose their trace, right? The other thing is definitely scalability. So, a lot of people can't afford these chains. That's that's pretty obvious. And the other thing is interoperability. So a lot of people use again centralized exchanges to um, switch, uh, you know, blockchains, swap uh, swap their tokens and whatnot. So we need like 
decentralized and secure versions of, of, of bridges uh, and applications, like cross-chain applications, basically. And then finally, we need uh, better access control. What, what, what I mean by access control is that currently in the blockchain space, access control is literally binary. Like you either own a private key, which you know gives you exclusive and irre irrevocable rights over your tokens, or if you lose that key, uh, too bad, right? Like nobody can help you. That thought is like a very scary thought for a lot of people and rightfully so, right? So, you know, we can't, we can't, we simply can't like on, on board mainstream with that kind of like um, user experience of self custody. So we need better solutions there. Um, like one of the, one of the solutions uh, that I'm really excited for is account abstraction. And account abstraction, you know, um, it, it's it's been around, it's been like discussed since uh, a few years now. It's it's actually nothing new, but I, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be sooner or later implemented. In fact, some of the rollups like zk sync and Starkware already have some forms of it, and Fuel as well. Basically, what it does is uh, I can summarize it as like it makes everything about self custody very user friendly. So you can have you know social recovery, you can assign different signers uh, for some of your funds, you can have recurring payments, you can have, you know, you can have like gas sponsored transactions, like somebody else can pay gas for you, some application can subsidize your gas cost for you and whatnot. So all of these things that, that will make interacting with blockchains much, much easier and much more like user friendly. I think it's going to be a combination of these. Uh, that's, that's how we reach mainstream basically. I love this question because I have a great answer to this. So there's this new sort of movement. It's called uh, collaborative finance or in short, co-fi. And uh, this movement is about creating a better superior form of money. It's like simplest way to understand this is basically like, it's a very silly, but also very easy thing to understand. If I owe $3 to Bob and Bob owes $3 to Alice and Alice owes $3 to me, the only thing that we have to like recognize is that we need to be aware of this loop, right? We don't actually need $3. We can just like basically write off our, our debt against each other. And so in, in, such a, in such a circular loop, we actually don't need to inject any liquidity, any, any tokens in there. That is effectively how a liquidity is saved and if you think about you know commerce, you know every um, you know every uh, every business effectively have account receivable, account payable, and they effectively send invoices to each other and they make trades with each other. And so these loops actually exist in the economy. And there's actually a very like highly ambitious project uh, in Cosmos that is built by informal systems is addressing this problem. So yeah, that's like uh, that's like a very very ambitious uh, thing. But I think like. If that become a reality, I mean, that's, that that could save a lot of uh, that could save a lot of problems that that we have in the current money system, actually. Mm -hmm.